Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. As you hop in, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. We are so excited you are here today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kelly Hudson and the title of my session is Creating Scientists with Seesaw. So our agenda for today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about myself. We're going to cover curriculum design and unit planning. And then I'm going to give you um, a full unit from start to finish, day one of what I do. And then I'm going to cover some skills and practices in science from first grade to fifth grade. So you see that progression and um, how student, students develop and their skills improve and then share some resources with you. So I am an elementary science teacher and I know that's a very unique position. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. I have an elementary education degree. I wanted to be a first grade teacher my entire life. That's what I wanted to do. Maybe kindergarten, maybe second grade, but I really wanted to teach first grade. I was not a science person. I was not a techie person. Um, some things changed. Fate intervened and um, my life was changed. My senior year in college, I lived in Florida and there was a freeze on hiring teachers in the state of Florida. So that made me pivot. Um, I had been wanting to move back to Illinois, my home state, um, but that meant I had to go back to school. And so during that time, I was a substitute teacher and something transformational happened. I was put at a school for a week assignment, and when I wasn't in the classrooms covering teachers, I was put in a computer lab. Um, that, for those of you who are young, you will not understand this, but there was no technology um, instruction in my college program. Technology was new in elementary schools, so this really um, was an eye-opening to me. There was an amazing teacher in that computer lab. We bonded and almost immediately I was hired by that school to be a computer lab assistant. So I was going back to school. I was working in this computer lab. Um, and when I look back on it now, I realized that I was a risk taker um, because the next year when I had my teaching certificate, I applied to be a technology curriculum, curriculum coordinator and first grade science teacher. Um, and I got the job. I knew just enough technology um, or more than um, what most teachers did because it was new. This was just being put into the classrooms. And so I was able to um, do a ton of professional development um, and I got to teach first grade science. And so that was super exciting. And so that really changed who I am and where I was going in my career. Um, during that time, I also got married um, and I was going to have a baby. So we decided to move out of Chicago. And again, at this time, Illinois was putting a ton of money into technology in the classrooms with grants, but you had to have, um, it had to be engaged. So it couldn't be just rote memorization. Um, you really had to um, integrate it into the curriculum, which is what I've been doing. So I was trained in Engaged Learning, this initiative, um, and I traveled around the state and I did workshops for this. But I was hired by one particular school to be their Engaged Learning and Technology Consultant three days a week. Um, and I did that for three years. Um, it was winter one year, we were in Florida, there was a blizzard in Illinois, and we decided, why are we in Illinois? So we moved to Florida to be near my family, and I was hired by the school that I'm at now. Um, my first position was to be fourth grade science and technology. Um, so I had four classes of science a day and one computer class a day. Um, again, great mentors. So this is my 25th year at that same school, but now um, I'm not teaching separate computer classes. I'm just the elementary um, first through fifth grade science teacher. So all of those things have led me to who I am today, but Seesaw had a huge impact impact on that. In 2015, I believe, is when I started using it. Uh, and then I became a Seesaw ambassador and then a Seesaw certified teacher. So I wanted to give you that background so that you can see that, um, one, I was not trained in science, but I love science. And so um, I'm going to hopefully share some things that you can take with you. So I love curriculum planning, and I'm sure most elementary teachers do. I love to spread it all out um, or have 5,000 tabs open, but I really love this quote. 
Curriculum design is a deliberate organization of content and learning experiences within a course or classroom. And I think that that's really important is to be a deliberate organization and Seesaw helps so much with that. So I have been in private schools my whole life. That was not in my, my intention, but it has allowed me to do all of my curriculum planning. So under new administration, we were encouraged to look at more closely at the standards. And so we've chose the next generation science standards, which has the disciplinary core ideas, cross-cutting concepts, and then science and engineering practices. I'm gonna just focus on the practices today because I think this is a great match with Seesaw because these are the things we want students doing. We want them asking questions. We want them using and developing models. We want them planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing, interpreting data, using mathematics and computational thinking, constructing explanations, engaging in argument from evidence, and obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. These are the things that used to be called science process skills and now are called practices. And the reason I use Seesaw is it encourages engagement, my engagement and the student engagement. And that's because it includes creativity, collaboration, and communication. Um, and I get to be creative, my students get to be creative, and um, all of those things together, I think helps them retain information more. I love the parent communication aspect of Seesaw. They get to see what is happening in my classroom on a daily basis. And then that um, the fact that I can differentiate instruction and that I have the built-in assessments that I can provide so many different ways of giving students feedback. And then of course, in the classroom, in a real setting, I am building those digital literacy skills and digital citizenship. So for me, taking the next generation science practices, the things we want students to do with Seesaw, I'm getting in those essential 21st century skills of creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication on a daily basis in my classroom. So for unit planning, I love to create a a curriculum map, not just for the entire year, but for each unit. So last year was the first year that I started teaching first grade again. I had just been doing second through fifth. Um, and so I was so excited to get first grade back in my life. And so when I was planning each unit, I had to look at the standards and then I had to identify learning objectives. Those things came before I started designing my learning activities. I needed to know where I was going, what I wanted to cover. Then I started looking at what Seesaw features could I use to make those activities the best. I planned my assessment strategies, um, how I wanted to assess what they were doing, all of the time trying to be sure that I was really promoting collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. And then as I'm doing the unit, I'm constantly monitoring it. I'm having to adjust it. After the unit, I'm reflecting, I'm iterating it. I like to go back and improve my units um, after I have planned them. So that's all on a big piece of paper. This is a unit that I chose this summer to um, improve, my dolphin unit. So I'm located in Florida. We're on a, our school is on a barrier island in between the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian River Lagoon. So each year I have an environmental unit that is specifically designed for um, something that is close to us. And in third grade, it's bottlenose dolphins. So what I do is I look at the standards to see what am I going to teach? But in each activity, I am building in one of these practices and some cross-cutting concepts of what can I weave throughout the unit in order to, again, make scientists. So this unit, um, Mealworm Metamorphosis, is a unit that I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to start from the first activity to the last. And I chose this because you're going to get an idea of where I start in first grade, um, the second week of school. So um, making observations. This is not one of the practices, but it's built into asking questions. So on the second week of first grade, the first week of first grade, they come in, they just look around my room. It's a very exciting place. Um, and so they take pictures of the things they're excited about. And then the second week, they're actually ready to do science. So I feel like 
sometimes we assume that students are great at making observations. But I think in the last 10 years, I've really noticed that they're not coming in with as many um, experiences from home. They're not spending as much time outside. They're not building with their toys as much. Um, and so we really need to be um, purposeful in giving students time to make observations. Now you'll notice I have microscopes and I want first graders using microscopes. These microscopes are probably 30 years old. I've been here for 25 years. They were old when I arrived. Well, they weren't old when I arrived. But when I need microscopes, um, I can also borrow from our high school. So I just feel like giving them tools makes them feel like scientists. So when I am planning an activity, um, all of these are linked um, in the lesson plans that I'm providing for you as resources. But you notice here in the activity that I have a video recorded. What I've realized that it's really impactful is for me to have those videos pre-recorded so that if I have a substitute um, who is teaching that class, my students can hear my voice introducing the concepts. Um, it also, though, you can notice up here, it says one of eight slides. It's also available for other teachers who I share these activities with, or if I'm designing activities for another school, that they can record their themselves, but they also have that video of watching, that opportunity to watch my videos to maybe if they're not as confident in teaching science. So this first activity is on making observations. So they've rotated through the stations, and I'm gonna share this example with you of one of my students, so they rotated through the stations. And what I'm looking for here is for them to actually describe what they're seeing. The eggs were white and round. So she did that. She described exactly what she was seeing. She didn't talk about how she loved the science classroom or using a microscope, but actually described what she was seeing. They're, young. they're long with yellow legs. So that was a great example. Again, they rotated through the four stations um, and introduced that. This video that I had introduced them to the activity and it also introduced them to the concept. So I'm gonna share that with you just briefly so that you can see um, that when you click on the link that'll be in the lesson plans, if you choose save activity, then it will go into your own library and you will be able to edit it. You'll also be able to preview it and watch the video. So when this video plays, you will have an introduction that you will see how the students are introduced to this activity. So this will help you um, see the, the skill that is making observations is an important skill in science. So we have our five senses for making observations, but we're gonna focus on our sense of sight today. So we'll have our eyes for making observations, but we're also going to use two tools, a microscope and a magnifying glass for making observations. You are going to be observing the darkling beetle life cycle today. You will observe the eggs, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. Darkling beetles are insects. That means that they have six legs and three body parts. At the first station, you are... So you can see that as they watch that video, they're getting an introduction to the activity. So this is the second week. This is where we're ready to start asking questions. So the first week they rotated through the stations. On this activity, they are experiencing, they were not rotating. I have an egg, a larga, larva, a pupa, an adult at the table. They get about 15 minutes, again, to make observations, to hold them if they want, really trying to pique their curiosity. So the second activity is asking questions. And in the past, I always just had them come back to a chart paper and we listed the questions. But now I like to have them individually ask their questions because we all know that when you have the group gathered, it's the same kids who are participating. Um, and some of the other children are not having that opportunity. So this is an example of, again, it's the third week of science, a first grader 
asking questions. What do mealworms eat? Do mealworms sleep? What do they do all day? So by having them ask questions, um, then after they've clicked the green check, I have them come back to the chart paper and I write down their questions. These questions are going to guide us throughout the unit, but they've had that chance to each individually ask three questions. And again, this is difficult. I'm walking around. I'm having to spark their curiosity. I'm having them hold the, the larva in order to come up with questions. Um, something else that I do with first graders, well, actually I do it for first through third grade, but as I finish an activity, um, I have them when they do the green check on their name tag, which is just an index card folded over, they get to get a sticker, just a little reward sticker to put on there. That way they're not leaving my classroom without having done the green check. That's just a little pro tip that I've picked up over the years. The next practice is obtaining and communicating information. So I feel that this is happening on a daily basis in my classroom. Um, students just absorb the information. Um, I'm going to tell you that the actual practice is obtaining, evaluating, communicating information. I'm not having first graders evaluate the information, but they are obtaining and using the information. So I start this lesson by reading a book about mealworms. And then the students have a pamphlet. It's a two-page pamphlet that are in the lesson plans. And it talks about each of the parts of the mealworm. So they're looking at that together. And then I'm playing this video where I'm introducing the anatomy of the darkling beetle. And then when they do this activity, I'm seeing, did they learn from, did they obtain that information and can they communicate that information? So this is a self-graded um, activity and then they were asked to record. We learned that darkling beetles have wings, legs, and antennas. Their antennas help them smell and they, they have wings, but the wings don't help them fly. So she gave two facts about the mealworm, and I can see that on the first try, she got all of the answers correct, so that I know that she was able to um, learn that information that she has been gathering for the past few weeks. So the next practice is using mathematical and computational thinking. And this does not always mean actually um, you know, doing math. This is how can we look at every activity and figure out where is the math in this lesson? So this, the students are building on their knowledge of the body parts. And so again, they're rotating through the stations and looking under microscopes. This activity is super easy as far as how many body parts they answer the question. Um, when they get it correct, then they move to the next station. How many antennas? They move to the next station. How many eyes, wings? And so they don't necessarily, many of them have to look under the microscope, but some of them do. Some of them don't get them all correct on the first time. But here's where we're really making a difference. Again, this is like the fourth class of first grade. I project this up. And we start looking at the data. And so they enter in the data for um, each of the categories for body parts, legs, wings, antenna, and compound eyes. And then I say, what do you notice about the butterfly, the ladybug, the fly, the bee, the grasshopper, the mosquito, and the darkling beetle? You can have kids raise their hand or even better yet, talk as a group. What did they notice about the body parts? What did they notice about the number of legs? What did they notice about the number of wings? What did they notice about the antenna? So let's listen to what um, she came up with. I learned that darkened beetles have three body parts, like all insects, and they also have six legs and two wings, sometimes four, and they also have two antennas and two eyes. So this is the beginning of actually analyzing data, and I'm doing it at the beginning of first grade. So making and analyzing models. 
in science, I really try really hard to not just make it a craft, but to make it a meaningful model where the students are actually um, analyzing the model and having choice in what they're doing. I love Seesaw because they have choice in how they share their work, but also choice in making the models. So I put a ton of different materials out, and this is the example that was created. And again, I'm expecting them to make an analysis between the real darkling beetle and their model. I made a model of a darkling beetle. And it's like a real beetle because it has two antennas, two eyes, th three legs. Well, three legs on each side and two wings, a head, an uh, an abdomen and a thorax. So I love in this video that you actually hear the hesitation and when she's correcting herself because she's building that knowledge. This is not about memorizing it. This is not just about what should I say when I record. This is her actually sharing what she knows and she's just learning. The next is, well, again, I'm showing another example of analyzing um, models and making models. So I used to have them make a um, life cycle with cards that I had, pictures. I've also done it as a seesaw activity. We're moving the clip art around. And this year I actually had them move the um, actual egg, larva, pupa, and adult. They had arrows that they moved on a big piece of paper. Um, and for some reason, this just felt like the best way for students to show this model. And it really was quite successful. So in this example, she is communicating um, or creating an explanation of the life cycle. So this is <clears throat> her coming up with um, an example, this student coming up with an explanation using everything they've learned from the first week of school. We made a life cycle mo model. This is the egg, the larva, the pupil, and the adult. So something that is really cute is to have them record their own videos. Um, and so obviously I have permission to use this um, video, but this is something that will this child and parent will cherish forever. At the end of fifth grade, they look back on what they've, um, the work they've done in the previous grades, and it's just priceless to have this explanation. When you grow up and lay eggs, and after they lay eggs, Eggs, they turn into a mealworm, and then after they turn into a mealworm, soon they'll form, form into a pupil, and then they'll turn into a that beetle. That um, and then here is the built-in assessment. This let gives me an idea of who um, was able to do this correctly and how many time, how many tries it took. Um, and you'd be surprised that about a third of the class missed it. They didn't get it correct on the first try, even after all of these activities. And it's because they weren't paying attention to the arrows. They really wanted to come and tell me I got this wrong because I didn't look at the arrows. But in science, the arrows mean everything in a life cycle model. So they learned an important lesson in first grade. There were no stakes. Um, and that's just a really important thing to learn um, and to be okay that it's okay you didn't get it in just one try. The next is engaging in argument using evidence. I feel like this is the hardest one to capture. So I feel like Seesaw is the an excellent way for students to demonstrate their acquisition of science and engineering um, practices and all of those skills that you're using in other subjects. But how do you capture an argument if you're not just taking a video of it? So I have edited this activity several times to try to capture what's happening so that you can get an idea of the argument that goes into an activity like classifying. So in this activity, let's see, let's pull this up. 
I start by having them make their own prediction on their own. So slide one is individual. I think this group is insects, and I think that group is not insects. So you notice she didn't tell why. And what I noticed is this is a really, really strong student. Um, it's a faculty kid. I used almost all faculty kids um, when I was getting permission. Really, really smart. They had a butterfly unit in, in kindergarten. We just finished. We're, we're getting close to the end of this unit. Um, and she didn't use the knowledge that I know she knows um, in, in classifying these animals. So then they were given a baggie of the animals. I also have this in a card version where it's just paper that you can cut out and laminate. Um, and they classify them. So let's listen. This is as a group. Me and my group classified animals to six legs and not six legs. We had a few disagreements, but we all d agreed in the end. And then I asked a question as a poll. Did you change any of your answers based on your scientific argument? And of course, she said yes here. So that's one way of capturing. So it doesn't actually show the argument, but you see the end result of having that opportunity to um, have an argument in science using evidence. And the evidence was the six legs. Okay, planning and carrying out investigations. So if you remember after the second activity, um, the inquiry activity, I had the children come back to me and I wrote out all of the questions on the chart paper. So I only have the first graders for about 35 minutes. It's supposed to be 40 minutes, but by the time they get there and they have to leave, it's about 35 minutes. So sometimes at the end, we go back to that chart paper and we see, do we know the answers to these questions? Um, and separately, I have them identify the questions that we could conduct an experiment. So before we ever conducted an experiment, we talked about what scientists do and how could we, first of all, we came up with variables. They, they came up with wet and dry, light and dark, um, and they voted. And, or, and we also, they voted on apples versus carrots of what they like to eat. Um, but we chose wet and dry. I did push them a little towards this. I thought this would be really easy to test. Um, we talked about making a circle, wetting one side. I had the children on the floor. And instead of the five groups that I normally have, I had them in three bigger groups just because there were mealworms crawling all over the place, which is why we did it on the floor because they moved so fast and we didn't want anyone to fall. Um, but in this activity then, let's see, pull this up. They made a prediction, um, and for the prediction, we talk about there's no right or wrong, so you can see that they circled dry. We did go over and look at the big mealworm habitat that's been in my classroom for probably the last 20 years, um, and they did, many of them made comments about the fact that it was dry, so most of them chose dry, and what do you know? It's not what happened. We did an experiment, and the larvas liked the wet more. Hmm. And then they graphed it. This graph shows that 10 larvas went to the wet side and five went to the dry side. So again, using that mathematical thinking, um, they circled the, um, if they were correct or incorrect, um, but really starting to conduct an experiment. We conducted it three times. Um, three different times. We decided on the amount of time that we would watch the mealworms. We thought that we were going to watch them for two minutes, but by two minutes, they would have been halfway across the room. It happened really, really fast. Um, and so I think we ended up with 45 seconds for each trial when we did this experiment. There were lots of squeals and tons of excitement in the room. So now I want to show you, so that's my mealworm unit. And again, that's the beginning of first grade. Now I want to show you a progression of the practices. So I chose one. I chose developing and using models because I think that's the one that uh, teachers are most confident in so that you can see some examples of um, models. So I, I showed you already two first grade. So here is a second grade. So our environmental unit in second grade is manatees. And this is something that my students um, love that in the classroom. 
Um, I have this baby manatee next to my door and there is a tape measure. And as they go through the years, they love seeing how tall they are compared to the baby manatee. This happens to be a very tall second grader. Most of the students are about the same height. Um, but they have learned that baby manatees are 120 to 140 centimeters when they're born. And so they wanted to find out how many centimeters they were when they were born. Uh, so I send out an email to parents. I have them send me their pictures. And this is a huge baby display. Baby manatees are 120 to 140 centimeters long when they are born. I was 52 centimeters when I was born. And now I am 140 centimeters now. So she learned that she is as um, taller than a baby manatee, but not by much, and that it took her eight years to get to that height. So I um, have them record, and then, so that's the first slide, then as a group, they make this model. So I give them a big piece of bulletin board paper and one meter stick, and they're working in groups of three or four, and they have to work together to build a life-size model. So their model has to be between 120 and 140 centimeters. So a meter stick is only 100 centimeters. So they have to figure out how to use that tool, how to make a mark, how not to exceed, you know, what percent of the body is head and um, what percent would be the tail and really looking at, we have tons of books in the classroom and then they draw their model. And then this yellow piece of yarn is how we really connect it to them. This is a manatee model that was 120 centimeters long. The yellow string is how long I was compared to a manatee when I was born. So we put the manatees out in the hallway and then um, I print out the QR codes so that all the kids can go by and scan the QR codes and parents that are visiting. So it really is um, a focal point in our hallway. The third graders, um, as I said, learned about echolocation. So I'm going to show you if you've never used um, Seesaw for animation, I hope that um, this example just sparks um, this idea for you because I use it all of the time. So if you notice up in the corner, it says this is one of 13 slides. And so this is like very old fashioned animation um, in this unit. This is a life. Um, really a life science um, unit, a biology or a marine biology, but we're learning about sound. So the time before this, we'd actually played with sound toys. We'd felt the vibrations. Um, we took a vibrating tuning fork and put it in water. We watched videos about echolocation. We read about echolocation and then they make this animation. So this is not a perfect example. I've been showing you ones that are, you know, close to perfect. This example um, isn't complete. It didn't say that the sound waves come out of the melon of the, um, the dolphin. It didn't say that it's sending sound waves to the water, um, hits the fish, and then bounces back, hits the, the beak or rostrum. The vibrations travel through the bones to the brain where an image forms in the brain. So they got most of it correct, just that little bit. But what an impressive way to show their understanding of echolocation is by making an animation. So in fourth grade, um, so first, second, and third grade have science once a week. In second grade, like I said, it's about 35 minutes in, that's first grade in 35 minutes. Second grade is an hour. Um, once a week. And then third grade is 80 minutes. So I have two, two blocks of a, two periods, um, a double period. So we get a lot accomplished. But in fourth grade, they have science every single day. So you'll really see the big jump in their, um, in the expectations and just of their, their knowledge. 
So um, we do a measurement unit before we learn about matter where they're learning to use all of the science tools they've learned about volume and mass um, separately. And then this is the introduction to density. So they could do anything that they wanted as far as touching it, but they couldn't do any measurements when they made their prediction. And they had to come to an agreement as a group. On this slide, they were saying that they um, all the liquids had the same volume, which is really important when you're comparing density. Then they used the triple beam balances to find the mass of each. They found that the syrup had the greatest mass. And then they poured them in and they determined that because the syrup went to the bottom, that it had the greatest density. And then this is a slide I want you to hear because this is their inference. So particles are something that are very hard for fourth graders to understand. They can't see them. Um, and so I have a model in my classroom. We talk about if um, the density is the amount of matter packed um, into the same space. So these cubes, it's hard to tell on my messy desk, but they're all the same size. They just have a different amount of balls in them. Um, and then they had to figure out which liquid then had the most particles packed inside. So this is an activity that the students were led from um, each slide really guided their lesson. I mean, you can see very, very involved directions on each slide for them to follow in order to do this activity as um, with a partner on their own without me directing each slide. So in fourth grade, um, I have them together do this little um, assessment and, you know, I can look back to see how many times um, it took them to answer this correctly. And then in fourth grade and fourth and fifth grade, they have to record the purpose of the activity. Why did we do this activity? What do they think the purpose of this was? So um, when I do multiple slides, I really try to have them only record 20 seconds per slide, which is very difficult. Um, I'd like them uh, to have their um, whole thing be less than a, to just be a minute or a minute and 20 seconds. Um, starting in, well, actually starting in first grade, that first unit of mealworms, I have them do individually. And then every unit I have them record at least one activity individually. But for the most part, they're recording with a partner. There's a rubric. They have to share equal time um, when they're recording and doing the activity. And I think that that just really brings in the collaboration. In fifth grade, I'm going to show you an estuary. So uh, remember I said that we're on a barrier island. Um, so we, our school actually is on the um, Indian River Lagoon and the lagoon is actually an estuary. So this is a model. We, um, look, we search our school on Google Earth. We zoom out so that we can see the Atlantic Ocean. We can see the barrier island. Um, I explain that the um, Indian Lagoon is also an estuary and an estuary is a body of water where salt and fresh water meet and mix. I could leave it at that, but instead we do this really cool model where they add a little bit of fresh water coming in from the creek and explain it in the caption. I mean, that's because they have a video here, a little bit of salt water. Um, and again, they explain it in the caption. And then this video. Where the steering is representing the wind mixing the fresh and the salt water. Um, and then the explanation here. Kelly, if you can play your videos, we're not hearing the sound. Oh, you're not. Okay. Thank you. Can you see the slide? Yep, we can see the video. We just aren't getting the audio, just so you know. Okay. All right. Um, 
Oh, there is no sound on the videos. They're talking in the caption. Are you hearing it in the caption? No. No, oh. no. Okay. Um, so doing this activity, um, what is really impactful as the students walk around, they're seeing that everyone's purple water is a little bit different in color. And that's really important because different spots of the Indian River Lagoon have different salinity, the amount of salt in them. And so kids start talking about that. Why did they have more salt? And then they start saying, oh, well, they just put in more blue. And then I'm asking them, what does this mean? So again, sparking that curiosity is really um, important. So that's an example of an estuary model. Um, again, you're seeing that growth from first grade to fifth grade. So I have one more example that I want to uh, share with you, and I'm hoping that the audio comes through here. All right, let's see. This is a photosynthesis model. Kelly, I think you have to play it. Remember how we, we have your videos downloaded, not the screen? I think that that's the issue. So if you go to video and play it from there, then we should be able to hear it. Have you not been able to hear all of them? No, not all, but but the past few we've been having trouble with. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. I'm not seeing where you're saying to go for video. So oh, what I slide see. is that, Kelly? I see. I'm sorry. Um, is it your photosynthesis? There you go. Yep. Yes. Today in science, we made a photosynthesis model. We had to make an animation explaining the three things needed for photosynthesis. The three things that we need are carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water. In this animation, you can see that we used all these things. First, energy from the sun reaches the plant and gathers on a leaf. Next, water is absorbed by the roots and goes up into the same leaf where it gathers with the sunlight. A human might walk by and breathe carbon dioxide into the plant where it gathers with the sunlight and water to create more body matter for the plant. So you can see how from first to fifth grade, the projects get more advanced, that they're really working together to come up with creative ways. So I didn't give them that sunflower. I didn't give them the sun. They came up with everything that they used and figuring out how to do it. So again, they've been building this knowledge. Um, this class of, of fifth graders started with me in second grade, but eventually I'll have had them from first grade and they're seeing how they can just develop their skills. So I see in the question, like, was this a group or independent? There are three voices on this activity. Generally speaking, I have 20 students in a classroom. And so they're with a partner um, when they're doing the seesaw. Um, but sometimes if someone is absent, then there might be three children working on it. Um, I do use rubrics to evaluate. They're graded on their recording. Um, and I'll share a little bit more um, with you on that in a minute. So for resources, um, if you have questions after this, um, I do have my email um, address linked. Um, there is a link to my Seesaw library where you can find the activities. Um, I have worked hard to try to go through oops, um, and, you know, clean out those um, activities and update them. Kelly, um, I just want to say we are just seeing your, your Seesaw screen that has the photosynthesis. Yep, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, in my Seesaw library, these are all of the activities that I've shared. So all of the activities from today, you'll see them. Um, I've been working through to update them. Any that have the videos mean that they have been updated with all of the new Seesaw features. Um, the mealworm unit, this is um, a unit that I have shared all of my lesson plans. Um, the lesson plans, a link to the activity, 
um, the practice that I'm encouraging in this activity. And when you go to the lesson plans, it includes obviously just general lesson plans. Um, but if you scroll all the way to the bottom, in first through third grade, um, we grade on a, sorry, slow down a little bit, um, on a scale of one to four, with four being exceeds um, expectations and three is meets expectations. Um, so what I've done is for the activities actually gone through and like observations are exceptionally detailed and precise, demonstrating advanced observation skills. Um, I've listed this here. Then I've actually listed three sample um, comments that I can put into the comment box. And so for first grade, I usually like type them, but then I will also do a voice recording so that I've really thought through what comments I want to make. In addition to this for uh, fourth and fifth grade, I um, also have a rubric that I use to grade their work. Um, and I will share a rubric with you if you'd like to see that. But here's an example of a fourth grade unit where I have the activity, the practices that are being um, focused on a student example. So you can see it from my magnet unit example for each. Um, and then the activities, like I was saying before, these are partner and small group where they're actually recording together. But I do a quick quiz, which is in Seesaw individually that they have to do. That way I can see individually, are they each getting the skills? And then something else I do that you'll see a lot in my own library is um, selfie sciences. So a selfie science is an enrichment that they can do from home. Um, and this one is to do a magic trick at home for their parents um, and then to record it. And then I get this. My goal in doing selfie sciences is to get them doing more science at home. So during the magnet unit, they're, you know, searching, they take a paper clip and search for magnets in their house, or they take a magnet and they search for magnetic things in their house, or like this one to make up a magic trick. This is a really popular one. Um, something else that I have them do is a lot of, um, they watch Bill Nye, they love Bill Nye, but again, it's, usually getting them outside doing things or visiting local um, facilities in our town that relate to the unit. So um, are there any questions? Yeah, there are a lot of questions. I just want to say that was absolutely phenomenal. The chat was blowing up, sharing um, how excited they are. So many amazing ideas. Um, so I want to start off with our first question. Um, how can teachers advocate for the importance of science and scientific thinking at the elementary level when there's so much focus nationally and statewide on literacy and math? Wondering if you have any suggestions. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know why this continues, why there's not more focus on science, because we know um, how important um, science and technology is to a global economic um, economy and that we are in a shortage of students in engineering in science programs we're in a shortage of doctors so I think that you know just sharing as much as you can at your own school um, I think will really really help um, I have been lucky that um, for most of my career, science has really been um, a focus at the schools that I've been at. But I know that I work with some teachers who have a really hard time getting, you know, one science lesson in a week. Yeah, it is. It's 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 a bummer that it's still such a fight because we obviously know how important it is and such a big it plays such a big role in so many jobs and life skills. Uh, another one, can I just add to that? Oh, one of the if you really um, looked at my lesson, though, I have reading. I can incorporate, well, the fourth and fifth grade definitely incorporates writing because I have them every day. Um, but really trying to look at across your curriculum, what standards could you get in 
by integrating it in science. And even though I just teach science, it is really integrated. Yes, it's very cross-curricular, your examples. That was very clear. Uh, with so much of science centered around observations, research, and inquiry, oftentimes you're going to get a lot of open-ended work from students, which we saw, which was phenomenal. Um, but an educator said that can be really time-consuming to assess. Do you have any time-saving tips for assessing some of that work that you shared? Mm. So this has been a struggle of mine. I tend to um, spend a lot of time grading. But what I have tried to do, um, one, I was overwhelmed. And so I had them started recording with a partner or with a group of three. And there's actually research on collaborative groups that students actually learn better in groups of three than in two, which I was very surprised about. Um, and I have a splitter so that on their iPads or Chromebooks, they plug it in and they all plug their microphones in and record together. What I was concerned about is that the maybe their comprehension went down. It went way up. They were really retaining because they were working in a collaborate group, trying to figure out how they were going to say it. Um, so they were doing much, much better on their seesaw grades because they were working together as a group. So some people worry that, oh, well, that kid's getting a better grade than that one. Um, but I balance that off by doing the quick quizzes after and seeing. And I just feel like anything that we can do to help children learn uh, just makes sense. Thank you. Um, so people were very impressed by all of the amazing lessons that you had created. So there were a few questions around like, how long does it take you to create them? How do you create them? So if you could just like give a little insight into maybe like how you create them and then how do you not make yourself feel so overwhelmed um, by like the amount of work you have? I, I do tend to get um, overwhelmed, but again, I love curriculum planning. And so you have to understand this is my 25th year doing this and I've been using Seesaw since almost the beginning. So it has grown. Um, so what I could say to you is that I have always been teaching the science and the science is the most important part. The seesaw activities have come, I don't even remember what year it was that activities became a thing, that I've been slowly, gradually making them, improving them. Um, and what I try to do is like this summer, I redid my dolphin unit. I'm passionate about it. I love doing it. I love sharing it with other schools. So my... I just love to do that. What I have really worked hard on is how can I streamline the grading and making it easier? And so usually I listen to the recordings, but sometimes it's, I look at the little uh, formative assessment that's there and that's okay. I can say, great job participating in this activity rather than um, it being a grade. But for the most part, the fourth and fifth grade, I do uh, really work hard to give them that feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think what's great is like, like you said, this summer you were modifying your lessons from last year. You know, they stay with you in Seesaw. You can modify them and build off of them. Another thing um, that I wanted to flag that within the Seesaw library, there's also a community library and of course, activities that Seesaw has created. But look at those. See if there's anything that fits your needs or you can make a copy of it and modify it to fit your needs. So don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel for everything. Let's work together to lighten the load. Um, I want to make sure everyone has time to go to their last session of the day. I know that we're going to have a closing book. One question that I'm curious if you just like have a tip because it did come up a few times. Um, you do so much recording, like students are recording. And um, a few people asked, like, I love doing this, but there's so much background noise when students record. Do you have any tips? I'm lucky that I also can use the hallway um, outside of our classroom. So they're in my room. I have a, a large room. They sometimes are under the desk, but I do have them use their headphones. Um, and so we have headphones with microphones. Um, I have tried the boxes where a lot of people will put their iPad or Chromebook in a box. Um, but for me, I just don't have any place to keep the boxes. Um, so 
some of them, you I obviously chose the ones who had really clear recordings. Some children, well, I also chose faculty children because um, it was easy to get permission. But some really care that it's super clear. And then others, the background noise does not bother them. Um, if I can't understand it, I do have them re-record. And so it's just a process that we've learned that, you know, three feet apart, but really using the microphone and having it right in front of their face rather than on the top of their head helps. Wonderful. Well, this was such a phenomenal uh, session. And um, as we mentioned in the chat, if you want to view anything that Kelly has shared, they're all available in the handouts. If you don't grab them here, again, all sessions will be available on demand until November 3rd. So you can grab them later. That is not a problem. Um, you will get your PD certificate emailed to you if you were here for the whole time. And now we're going to do a fun little giveaway. I will be contacting all winners of the giveaway next week. There is nothing you need to do. We have access to your emails to contact you. The winners are Lexi and Erica. Congratulations to our winners. Um, make sure that you join us in the closing award sessions at the end of the day today to kind of wrap up Seesaw Connect. We're going to be doing tons and tons of giveaways in there. Uh, thank you so much to Kelly and all of you for joining us and enjoy your last session before closing. Thank you all so much. Thanks.